I created the hardest Pokemon escape room ever, and I challenged five YouTubers to a race. I don't know, man. I don't know. What the heck, man? I feel like I'm really struggling here. No! No! <laughs> I'm so stupid. <laughs> Be the first one to beat the escape room and you win the challenge. But there's something genuinely beautiful about being pushed to your absolute limit. When you have an accomplishment, you feel good. But when you've truly, genuinely struggled to reach that goal, you don't just feel good, you feel amazing. Read like a book, okay? Level 14! Yes, you didn't PP max it. Okay, that battle's done. Oh my God! Finally! Oh my god! A Pokemon escape room is basically a group of Pokemon puzzles. Here you have five trainers in total that you have to beat. You have to collect items and figure out battle strategies to defeat these very difficult trainers. And spoiler warning, if you want to play this game before you finish watching the video, you can use the download link at the very top of the description to download the game. Everything is 100% free and the download link is completely safe. You can play the game and then come back and see how these YouTubers solve the puzzle. For trainer number one, you had to defeat a level 48 Oricorio, a level 100 Oricorio, and a level 14 Oricorio. And all you have is a level 30 Cresselia, a level 14 Ryulu, and a level 29 Snorunt. You also have access to a move tutor who can teach you most of the moves you learn via level up as well as some other moves too. But this battle is an almost impossible task. Even though Cresselia is a legendary Pokemon, it's never going to beat a level 100 Oricorio. Unless, however, you can figure out a winning strategy. And therein lies the game. These trainers are designed to test your knowledge, intelligence, and creativity. Every subtle detail you encounter is a hint that can help you put together pieces of the puzzle. There's a fine line between difficult and miserable. The challenge is supposed to be tough, but at least according to me, it's also fair. Every competitor has what it takes to win, and each competitor brought a unique skill set to the tournament. First, we had the favorite to win, Small Ant. Smollett has been doing Pokemon challenges for years now, and he probably knows everything about Pokemon and is smart enough to come up with a bunch of different solutions. Then we had Accolade, a speedrunner and a veteran to the Pokemon escape room meta. He knows how to think quickly, and that makes him a big threat in this type of high pressure environment where you not only have to solve puzzles, but you have to solve them fast. Then we had Wacko and DRXX from the Nuzlocke community. Nuzlockers have years of experience navigating tough situations and coming up with genius strategies to escape failure, but can they do it in a more abstract environment? And finally, we had Blunder, a competitive Pokemon player and the underdog of the tournament. Blunder is one of the best competitive players, but how much does that translate to a Pokemon escape room? In total, there were five competitors, each with their own advantages and disadvantages. The first piece of information that every player found was a message. All mechanics are Generation 9, trainers may be smarter than you expect, you are not expected to grind beyond one level, and all forms of luck have been removed. Basically, critical hits can't happen, Pokemon can't get flinched or frozen, you get the idea. Everything is determined and not random. And here is where we had the first hurdle. Most trainers saw that level 48 or choreo and tried to find a way to force their way through it. They had no idea about the level 100 or choreo that came after it. They came up with all sorts of interesting strategies to try and beat that. For example, one really cool strategy was to use skill swap Cresselia to switch abilities with Oricorio. Oricorio's dancer ability means that it copies every dance move used on the field. For example, if you use Swords Dance, an Oricorio will copy that and use Swords Dance too. If you skill swapped, then you could use Oricorio's dancer ability against it and copy all of its quiver dance. But the truth is that this strategy doesn't work. Even if you come up with a perfect combination to beat level 48 Oricorio, you have no shot of beating the level 100 one. You had to realize you had to think outside the box in order to beat these overpowered Pokemon. I can force it to use Lunar Dance. And now it... Now it uses Lunar Dance and kills itself. Okay. Good. Oricorio. I just copycat and force it to end itself again? Yeah. Okay. The last one? 
Or Recorio, level 14. I don't know what it's gonna do. I'm gonna Icy Wind. And it's dead! Okay, one battle down. Easy battle, dude. Smollett was the first to figure out the Lunar Dance strategy, and the others were right on his tail. Every player knew what the Dancer ability did, but how quickly could you take advantage of it? Especially when you had a ton of different options to go through. Very intentionally, every Pokemon had a ton of options, which meant you had to critically understand the problem instead of trying everything. Oh, and also there was a strength puzzle that you had access to from the beginning, but had to complete before the fourth trainer. Coincidentally, all competitors attempted and finished it before the first trainer itself. It looks like a children's puzzle. You have to use strength to move the boulders around onto the blue tiles. If you do, you get a reward. But this wasn't actually a children's puzzle. It's a type of problem called a Sokoban puzzle, named after the original Japanese Sokoban game. The Sokoban game has been studied under computational complexity and is classified as an NP hard problem. On top of that, I picked one of the more difficult Sokoban problems I could find, and it was especially evil because it was very easy to get 5 out of 6 boulders correct, but very difficult to get all 6 of them correctly placed. The strength puzzle added time to all players, but it was a really good feeling when someone finally completed it. Oh, I'm s- ah! Wow. This is so beautiful. I'm gonna I'm cry tears of joy. But then there was trainer number two. Your Snorunt can now evolve to Frostlass, but you have to fight a Pangoro. Pangoro is a monster who can one hit KO every Pokemon. Every Pokemon except for Frostlass. Because the terrain is snowy, Frostlass gets a 1.5 times boost to defense and is actually able to live a Pangoro hit. Remember, all luck is removed, so the damage output is going to be the same each time. But now what? Let me just see. Let me just try a different pet. B what? Fairy type special attacks don't work because the Pangoro is such a high level and has an assault vest. The next logical idea is Destiny Bond. I can't pre damage. He heals us before this fight intentionally. I'm supposed to be left at. Why wouldn't it work here? You can't use it twice in a row? Okay. But that doesn't work either. Ordinary Destiny Bond strategies don't work here because I did something a little sneaky. I gave this trainer custom AI to play like a human. Remember, trainers may be smarter than you expect. This trainer will try to avoid fainting to Destiny Bond, much like how a human would. For example, if Pangoro can knock out Frostlass with a bullet punch, it will. But it won't do it if knocking out Frostlass means it would also get knocked out by Destiny Bond. After a couple of failed battles, most competitors realized they were getting outsmarted by a Pangoro. But the real question is, what are you going to do about it? How are you going to outsmart the machine designed to outsmart you? Trainer number two was an absolute monster of a run killer. Every player was able to diagnose the problem, that the Pangora was too smart, but figuring out a solution was a lot trickier. And this is where Blunder made his move. He's a competitive player. Other players may have advantages in other parts of the game, but Blunder has been outsmarting humans for a decade now, and he figured out this solution the fastest. What you have to do is use the Move Tutor to teach Avalanche. It's f***ing, dude, it's f***ing Avalanche. I f Destiny Bond, and then I click Avalanche, and then I'm gonna go second. And then he's gonna f***ing kill me. Because he all, he clicks Darkest Larry a second. And then I'm going to the next Mon. This literally is the strat. This is the strat for sure. Avalanche is an attack that always goes last, and in exchange, its power doubles if it gets hit by the opponent. That can be used creatively to expand the range of Destiny Bond. Destiny Bond goes from your move to your next move, and by using Avalanche, you can fit two of Pangoro's attacks into that bracket of time. Everyone has seen Avalanche before, but you had to make the connection that you can take advantage of an attacking move like Avalanche, not for attacking, but for manipulating priority. Smallant and Blunder were the only two players to figure this out in a reasonable amount of time. Other players had major struggles. Okay, do we kill?
But after finishing that, that's where they headed to trainer number three, a double battle. And really quickly, if you like this video so far, subscribe to the channel. It's free and helps me out a lot. I put a lot of effort into making this ROM hack and seeing a lot of new subscribers would help send a positive signal for me to keep making more ROM hacks and to push the boundaries of the escape room community even further. But now back to the video. Now everyone's Ryulu gets replaced by a Protean Kecleon and you have to win a double battle versus a Snorlax and a Sand Slash Alola. Sand Slash Alola will outspeed you because of its Slush Rush ability and hit you with a strong Iron Head. Meanwhile, the Snorlax will use Curse to improve its attack and defense before trying to knock you out. You have to figure out how to deal with Snorlax before it gets out of hand, while also being prepared for a constant barrage of powerful attacks. The only double battle resource you have is that your Kecleon knows Fake Out. That means you can make your opponent flinch for one turn. That's all you have. Now what do you do with that one turn? Both Blunder and Smallland iterated through, slowly building up their solution and fleshing out different ideas. Uh, hold on, I'm getting closer. Because that's fixed for him to go for the second curse. Oh sh I knew it was the I knew this was the way to do it. I literally knew you have to skill swap onto Lax. I just know I just didn't know how to progress. But I knew for a fact, like I literally broke it down while I was uh talking about this. It took some time, but Blunder made progress and got a good finish with the intended solution. The main idea is that you have to use skill swap protein onto Cresselia and then onto Snorlax. When a protein Pokemon uses Curse, the mechanic is incredibly interesting. Curse first chooses the target, in this case it chooses yourself. Then Protean activates to change the type, and then the move is made depending on that type. So Protean Curse means that you end up cursing yourself. Once you figure that out, the rest of the fight becomes pretty easy. On the other hand, Small Ant had a solution that I didn't expect. He didn't go for that Protean Curse route. He found his own way of doing things. Um, and then we waste one turn here, guard swapping Kecleon as we disable Iron Head. He used Curse a second time, which is what we need. So then now we will guard swap Snorlax and um, Ancient Power Sand Slash. We're gonna hope that... Yes, perfect! Okay. Skill swap with you? No, I'll skill swap with you. And you'll destiny bond. Okay. So Snorlax goes down. We have our defense boosts. I believe now all we do is Lunar Blessing. And we should win. We just need to wait 15 turns. Because we guaranteed we'll never get flinched because luck isn't involved. And Iron Head has 15 power points. At this point, it was pretty neck and neck with Accolade coming in at a distant third. Yeah! Howard Dean, baby. Before Trainer 4, you gotta trade for a Sloking. You cannot beat the Fair at the one with what you have. But there is a patch of grass where you can fight Pokemon. And here is where you have to make a callback. You can level up by one. And Sloking is one of the few Pokemon that learn Surf by level up. And when you learn Surf by level up, you can access the water from earlier in the map. You've gotta be kidding me. Fire Blast. The Fire Blast TM makes this fight pretty easy. There are some other Pokemon you need to figure out, but those are pretty trivial. The real key was finding Fire Blast for the impossible Ferrothorn. At this point, both Smallin and Blunder are still neck and neck as they reach the fifth and final trainer. Who's gonna win, the favorite or the underdog? You get a whole new roster of Pokemon here with a Hariyama, a Ledian, and a Togekiss to replace all your non-legendary Pokemon. It's an incredibly tough double battle where you have to deal with Dark Void Darkrai, who can put both of your Pokemon to sleep, Intimidate Arcanine with Flare Blitz, Metacham, and Melmetal. 
A lot of this fight is iterating, trying to find the right combination of moves so that you can get to the finish line. There's no magic fire blast bullet like the last one. The benefit though is that because there's so many combinations, there are actually many ways to win the fight. There's no one correct answer. Wait. Wait, I win, don't I? Wait, check me out, check me out, check me out. Yeah. Wait, yeah. Yeah! Right? Wait, Mel's gonna die. I'm not in Tim. Oh my god. Oh my god. Yo, am I gonna get to eat lunch? Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Yo, speed up. Bitch. Send it out. Send it out. Come on. 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 Please kill. If this doesn't kill, somebody's dying. AKA my computer desk. Two pieces. Karate chop down the middle. Come on. Come on. Yes! I won! Yo, I fucking won! After some trial and error, Blunder finishes the escape room at 4 hours and 20 minutes. Accolade would find his own unique solution and finish at 4 hours and 50 minutes. Wacko and DRXX would not finish. And what about Small Ant? Did he beat Blunder's time of 4 hours and 20 minutes? I was pretty proud of the ROM hack I made. I thought I accounted for everything. In particular, one of the things I removed was luck from everything. No critical hits, no flinches, nothing. But my masterpiece did have a couple of mistakes. One of them was that I forgot to alter the move Detect. Detect is a move that protects you but has a 33% chance to fail if you use Detect again and again. Detect becomes more likely to fail with each usage, but it never becomes 0%. Small Ant taught his Hariyama Detect and kept resetting the game until he added Protect 5 times in a row. Hariyama would serve as bait with the opponent's Pokemon attacking into it doing nothing, meanwhile the second Pokemon was able to do whatever it wanted. It could be okay, because my wish came true. Extreme speed! Extreme speed! Extreme speed! Extreme speed! That's it! He found the one exploit in my game and punished me for it. And with that, Small Ant finished with the fastest time at 3 hours and 20 minutes, getting first place and winning the race. There was no upset victory this time. Congratulations to Small Ant for winning the Pokemon Escape Room, and congratulations to everyone who participated. Their channels are posted in the description down below, so give them some love. Also, a special shout out to the Team Aqua's Hideout community for helping me make this ROM hack, and to Archie for his ROM hacking YouTube tutorials. And hopefully, I'll be able to create my second escape room in the near future, so stay tuned. See you guys then.